Hi, I'm, I'm Dr. Pat Fitzgerald. I'm the medical director of the, bari the Comprehensive Bariatric Program at Sarasota Memorial Hospital. I'd like to welcome you all tonight to the uh, Meet the Surgeon. Let me start out by uh, uh, introducing you to uh, our three surgeons. Uh, I mentioned my name. Scott Stevens is our band surgeon uh, and Dr. John Nora is a uh, robotic surgeon that does uh, gastric bypass. I do uh, uh, laparoscopic uh, gastric bypass and we've just started our sleeve program. Our comprehensive bariatric program at Sarasota Memorial is dedicated to the treatment and prevention of obesity and allied diseases. Treatments include a comprehensive weight loss program, monthly support groups, diabetes management, and surgical intervention, which include Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, sleeve gastrectomy, and adjustable gastric banding. Along with this surgical intervention is uh, uh, pre- and post-operative education and support, hence the comprehensive nature of the program. These surgical procedures are the most common that are uh, available, procedures available today for the uh, surgical management of of uh, obesity. You've met uh, much of our staff. I'd like to uh, point them out by name. Uh, program director is Adina Osika. Our nurse practitioner is Lori Swanson. Our program coordinator is Stella Nichols, who you've met. Registered dietit dietitian is Linda Adams. She's here tonight. Uh, our patient liaison and data reviewer is Marie Seeger. And our insurance specialist is Sue Hudson. Marie is here as well tonight. So for tonight's purposes, we're going to look at these topics. Uh, we're going to define the uh, nature of morbid obesity. We're going to talk about the rationale for surgery as a treatment option. We're going to review the aforementioned uh, procedures, including the bypass, the band, and the sleeve gastrectomy. We'll talk briefly about risk and complications, who is a candidate and by um, exclusion who is not a candidate. And briefly we'll discuss dietary and fitness lifestyle changes, which uh, will be repeated over and over again and you'll be very familiar with the uh, lifestyle issues um, before you ever uh, come to surgery. So the ASMBS is the main um, uh, uh, professional society when we when we talk about surgery for obesity it's the American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric uh, Society they have uh, uh, defined morbid obesity as a lifelong progressive life-threatening genetically related costly and multifactorial disease of excess fat storage with multiple comorbidities um, or another way of saying uh, obesity-related health conditions. So everyone knows, I'm sure, by looking on the internet, what a significant public health problem we have in obesity. It uh, is considered epidemic, even pandemic, um, and uh, an estimated 1.7 billion people worldwide are affected. Um, fully uh, two-thirds of the U.S. population is overweight, one-third or 35 percent are obese. And this is not just limited to adults, it uh, has a significant pre presence in children. If 10 million people are morbidly obese uh, as an estimate, then the medical costs uh, are over 150 billion annually, 400,000 obesity-related deaths occur annually, second only to cardiovascular disease. Obesity-related conditions are now the second most common cause of death in the United States. Studies show repeatedly that uh, there's virtually a 100% failure rate, weight loss, over a five-year period for patients who, who uh, use simply diet and exercise. And by that I mean as little as 5% weight loss. Maintaining 5% weight loss over five years is extremely difficult to do. 
uh, using non-operative or non-surgical methods. Surgery is the standard of care for nearly every patient with clinically severe obesity. Uh, the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, came out with a consensus statement um, over 20 years ago, um, which stated only surgery has pr proven the eff effective over the long term for most patients with clinically severe obesity. And that is our uh, primary public health institution, the National Institute of Health. So when we talk about surgery for obesity, um, what we're really talking about is control of comorbid uh, conditions. The weight loss is important, obviously, and that's the most obvious manifestation of success. But what's more important is the, is the effect of, of the surgery on the comorbidities, which include uh, cancer risk, cardiovascular disease, endocrine, uh, pulmonary, all of these disorders are affected. This slide depicts much of the uh, secondary effects of obesity. You'll notice in the, uh, in the red, the highlighted ones which include hypercholesterolemia, that's elevated uh, cholesterol and triglycerides, hypertension, metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes are all dramatically affected uh, by surgery. Um, uh, anywhere from 61% resolved with uh, elevated cholesterol uh, to as high as 98% improved or resolved type 2 diabetes. And you can see these others are important too. Obstructive sleep apnea is is very much improved or even resolved after weight loss surgery. Um, gastroesophageal reflux disease is another one, and then there are others. Uh, venous stasis disease, degenerative joint disease, depression, and down below here is a um, comment about quality of life and mortality reduction, which sort of the, are the, the major endpoints uh, that we talk about. Mortality reduction is significant. We'll see another slide about that. Quality of life is, is uh, hard to measure in, in, in some ways, but uh, very apparent to us who are primary caretakers in this endeavor. So the males, there's, there's a few um, gender-specific conditions, um, but the main ones are the same. The hypercholesterolemia, the hypertension, the metabolic syndrome, and the type 2 diabetes. And then, of course, the quality of life and mortality reductions are the same. Here's a slide that graphically depicts the, the mortality risk, and this was uh, uh, a paper in Annals of Surgery in 2004, Christou uh, reported that the relative risk reduction uh, was 0.11 or 89%. In other words, it's almost 100% reduction in uh, mortality, risk of mortality in a matched population of obese patients over a five-year period. That is a tremendous improvement. That's like saying you're curing diabetes. It's a profound effect. And then the NIH, again in 1991, pointed out that the quality of life issues are uh, improved uh, significantly. Uh, that include self-esteem, physical activity, the physicality um, of, of this uh, process is extremely uh, positive. Um, we see that in, in all our patients over the course of the post-op period. Uh, social contact, work satisfaction, intimacy, and uh, uh, overall relationship to, to food and nutrition is enhanced. So how do we define obesity? Well, we use uh, body mass index, which y'all are probably all familiar with from going online. That's a number that that basically normalizes 
mass um, uh, to height, and it's a measure of kilograms per meter squared. Um, those numbers range uh, for normal uh, BMIs between 18.5 and 24.9. And then you have increasing uh, uh, classes uh, beginning with overweight up to 29.9, and then class 1, 2, 3, 4, um, obesity. Um, you can see the numbers there, uh, with super obesity being BMIs greater than 50. And as you might expect, intuitively, the, the risk of uh, comorbid conditions goes up as the BMI goes up. The rationale for surgery is uh, pretty clear cut. Um, ever since the first iliojejunal bypass was done in the uh, early 60s, um, we've been evolving weight loss surgery. And as far as the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, which is basically the standard uh, nowadays by which all others are measured or compared, we've been doing them for over 45 years. So there's a very uh, uh, complete, mature um, database uh, to refer to um, when uh, discussing the success of that operation. We've been doing the same operation, precisely the same operation laparoscopically for 20 years. Um, now, as far as the gastric band goes, the FDA approved that procedure here in the United States in 2001. However, there's a strong lasting track record uh, elsewhere, including Australia, uh, Europe, and uh, Mexico, primarily. And finally, um, there are about 200,000 bariatric procedures performed every year. So we're really just scratching the surface with this procedure. Okay, so surgery works. We, we can see that uh, reproducibly. Um, but we know that uh, surgery alone is not the key to success. Um, it's important uh, that the patient uh, commit uh, in uh, a number of ways uh, to the success of the procedure. Compliance is the, uh, the key word with that, both dietary and exercise compliance. So who's a candidate? Anyone with a BMI of greater than 40 qualifies for the procedure. Anyone with a BMI of greater than 35 with severe comorbidities qualifies. Now the thinking there is that if you, already, if you have a lower BMI and already have established comorbidities, then you're acquiring end organ damage ongoing. That's already occurring, so there's no point in waiting um, till you, BMI increases to 40. It uh, uh, wouldn't make sense to uh, allow for additional damage. So the BMI requirement's a little lower if you already have established comorbidities. If you have a BMI of 40 and no comorbidities, the risk of you acquiring comorbidities is higher so the justification arises out of that expectation. Um, generally though, patients with BMIs greater than 40 do have significant comorbidities. Uh, we always ask our generic question in surgery, do the benefits outweigh the risks? This is, an opera, this is a question we ask patients if we're gonna take their gallbladder out, do a hernia. This is a standard question. Do the benefits, can we, be expected to improve the patient's overall situation rather than put them at increased risk for no good reason. That's a generic question that we ask. Multiple failed weight loss attempts is an important prerequisite for qualifying for the surgery and that's generally mandated by the insurance companies but makes sense. The, uh, the fact is, however, that virtually uh, well, we haven't had an example of anyone that's come to us who haven't tried on multiple occasions to lose weight. It's sort of a given. 
anyone coming to this point would, would have uh, experienced that, uh, that failure to lose weight successfully. Able to commit to dietary and fitness lifestyle changes. Well, that's, a, that's an important consideration. Um, much of this uh, uh, is based on behavior and um, the dietary compliance, as I've mentioned, and the exercise compliance is key to success. If you have surgery, you're going to lose weight. But if we're going to maximize benefit and outweigh the, you know, to outweigh the risk, then we'd like to have that commitment up front that uh, y'all are going to follow the, the dietary rules and, uh, and exercise which is an important component long term. Psychologically uh, be able to adhere to forced behavior modification. Invariably what, what we're doing here is we're altering the anatomy of your intestinal tract in one form or another to one degree or another and they impose certain restrictions on how you eat. If you do not take that into consideration and modify your behavior to accommodate those changes unpleasant things happen. And that's the nature of the negative feedback that's uh, helpful in transforming uh, behavior. And unless you're open to that, it can uh, be difficult for you. Everyone gets a psychological evaluation and that psychological evaluation is primarily um, uh, important uh, for two reasons. One, to determine whether or not you um, can accept the behavior modification and you're not uh, um, directly opposed to, to those changes. And also to rule out any significant psychopathology that would interfere with, with uh, that behavior modification. All right, and to commit to a non-smoking lifestyle. Um, that's important, at least from my standpoint, in that I think patients who smoke, who undergo bypass, have a significant increase uh, risk of complications. Um, so that's an important point for me. Treatment options. Historically, diet, exercise, behavior modification, and anorectic drugs have all been used. Uh, as I mentioned before, the failure rates are very high. If you uh, measure weight loss over a prolonged period of time, five years. Um, on the other hand, weight loss surgery is very durable and 60% uh, success rate at, at 15 years or more is uh, not uncommon. Okay, so the different treatment options that we'll talk about and, and uh, illustrate are the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass procedure. That's done both laparoscopically and open. It's the most commonly performed procedure out there. And it is composed of both restrictive and malabsorptive components. The laparoscopic adjustable gastric band is a restrictive procedure. And the laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy is a restrictive procedure with metabolic component. And we'll talk more about this. So here's, here's comparative illustrations for you to look at. Um, the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass consists of a small pouch constructed off the stomach at the top of the stomach where it connects to the esophagus. And then there's a rearrangement of the intestines uh, by which the food coming down is separated from the, uh, uh, the, the the food coming down this pipe is separated from the intestinal digestive juices originating in the, in the other portion. And we'll, we'll talk about that more. The restrictive component comes from the small pouch. You, you fill that pouch up, you get full. And if you eat more, you, you feel bad. Okay, so that restricts the amount of food you take in. The malabsorptive component comes from the altered digestion um, that we'll, we'll see. And that's a function of separating these two segments of bowel. The sleeve gastrectomy is 
is a restrictive component insofar as we're removing this large portion of the stomach. This is the receptive portion of the stomach, the part of the stomach that s expands to accommodate more and more food. Um, and that allows you to overeat. So when you take that out and just leave this tube, it's called tubularizing the stomach, then you, you get food, you get filled faster. You can't eat as much. This does not expand in the same way that this does. Okay, so that's the restrictive component. And you can obviously see this, this volume is much smaller than that volume. Um, it's not as small as that volume, but it's still very restrictive. And a word about the metabolic component. Now, it's not malabsorptive, but we found through studies that there is an effect on the metabolism, and it's related to removing this large portion of stomach where, where hormones originate that affect basically appetite. And uh, in fact, it has a dramatic effect on, on diabetes, which we'll, we'll uh, talk about some more. <coughs> and then the gastric band, um, everybody's probably seen this uh, um, on the internet. It's, it cons it's a restrictive procedure and it consists of formation of what's called a virtual pouch. This is a actual pouch and this is a virtual pouch in the sense that it's not divided, uh, okay, and made separate but it's partitioned by this band that is adjustable and can narrow the opening through which the food goes through, okay? We'll talk more about that. Okay, so the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass. Again, it's a combination of restriction and malabsorption. It's the most frequently performed bariatric procedure in the U.S. About 50% of the procedures are done uh, with the bypass. First done in 67, laparoscopically uh, since 93. You get very significant weight loss. Um, I would say generally it's 60% um, after four or five years. And um, it resolves type 2 diabetes in more than 83% of the patients. It improves uh, or resolves diabetes in virtually every patient, okay? So it reduces the size of the stomach to about 30 cc's, okay? Um, a, a cup, maybe a little more. It uh, separates the large part of the stomach from the pouch. In other words, it's not just stapled off, it's actually stapled and cut, so they're separated. The small intestine are divided to create what's called a, a Ruin Y limb. And this is the, the, this, the rearrangement that is responsible for the malabsorption. The malabsorption is simply, um, it, well it's synonymous with maldigestion, okay? It's impaired digestion. The way I like to describe this, try and think of it, is if the food comes down this pipe and digestive enzymes come down this pipe or segment of bowel, then the food and the digestive enzymes don't meet until you get to the, to the Y, the, the, the two arms of the Y coming together, right? And those digestive enzymes have to mix with the food and break the food down to a macromolecular level, a molecular level, so they can be absorbed. And if you don't get that sort of terminal digestion, the nutrients and calories are not able to be absorbed. If you make this junction say halfway down 
the bowel, then you've impaired digestion in, in some significant way because you only have, but if you only have half of the bowel left um, to transit for the food to be digested all the way down to the molecular level and then absorbed, there's just not enough time to get it all in. That's where the malabsorption comes in. And then what's not absorbed is eliminated. And that combines with the restrictive component of a small pouch to give you weight loss, which is summarized right here. Less food taken in because of the restriction, less food absorbed. Okay? Does everybody understand that? It's, it's important for you to understand that sort of basic physio physiology of the bypass um, because I think understanding it gives you some degree of faith that it'll work up front. You're going to see that it works if you have it done. Just to summarize, small gastric pouch limits food intake. Food has no contact with duodenum where most absorption occurs, nor does it get broken down by the enzymes. Um, the enzymes don't meet the food until you get to the common limb, and hence you get the malabsorption. Okay, so outcomes, you get rapid weight loss over the first six, to six weeks to three months. That's a, it's a pretty significant weight loss. The long-term weight loss, which lasts 12 months to 18 months, or even longer, is dictated by both diet, dietary compliance, and exercise. The, the rapid weight loss is eventually going to taper off, say three months. You're going to lose pretty good weight over the first three months, and it's going to slow down. After three months losing 50 pounds, you're going to have a different physicality. There's going to be this sense you of of doing things, you're going to be more active. And what, what we like to see is at that two to three month period after your surgery, you start to pick up your exercise. And what that exercise does is it burns calories. It's not about eating less or malabsorption, it's about burning calories. And what that exercise does is it, it dovetails with that dietary weight loss, it's diet that's decreasing, not going away, just decreasing. The rate slows down, the rate of weight loss slows down, and we like to augment that beginning around two or three months with exercise. And what you get if you are compliant and you do the diet, you follow the instructions, and you exercise, not like a, a, a gym rat, but just healthy exercise, enjoyable exercise, really. It's just about burning calories. Um, you get a very durable and lasting weight loss that can go on for 12 or 18 months. And that, those are the patients that get the best result. Your comorbidities improve um, to varying degrees through that entire process. Um, what we found and, and uh, is, is seen universally, really, in, in, the, uh, in these post-op patients, in the, in the bypass patients, is that diabetes gets better immediately. There's an immediate reduction in, in requirements of medicine. And um, frequently, um, we'll send patients home two days after surgery on no medications. Um, that is not uncommon. The patients who do require some medicine are the, usually the ones that have had insulin-dependent diabetes and, uh, for a long period of time and high, have high medicine requirements. But it, even those are, are uh, improved dramatically very early on. And then you'll get ongoing improvement as the weight comes off um, through the months. Hypertension is improved, the, the cholesterol problem gets better and sleep apnea improves dramatically. Over the uh, 
uh, post-op period. So the sleeve gastrectomy. This is a restrictive procedure with a metabolic component. Uh, by that I mean you limit the amount of food that you can hold by decreasing the capacity of the stomach and then you get a metabolic improvement by removing this large portion of the stomach which is uh, um, producing hormones such as ghrelin responsible for appetite. Um, originally this was performed as a staged procedure. It was the first part of a staged procedure in patients who were um, severely obese, BMIs in the 60, 70 and higher range. This is a safer operation. It was easier to go in, do that procedure, get 100 pounds off over the first year or so, and then take the patient back and convert them to a gastric bypass. What was found consistently in, uh, um, uh, by many surgeons was that the patients came back after the, the uh, sleeve portion after a year or, or more, and the patients were satisfied with the result. They got good weight loss, there was a significant improvement in comorbidities, and there was no compelling reason to undergo the second portion of the operation. So frequently, the patients declined the gastric bypass and did very well. Well, that, that went on for a while and it became apparent that this could be done as a freestanding procedure, and that's the case now. Uh, and it's becoming more and more popular. So we reduce the stomach capacity. Uh, the reason it's safer is we're not rerouting any of the intestines, okay? It's just one long cut. Um, again, there's a significant improvement in these major comorbidities. Uh, the gastric band. Now this is a procedure that's purely restrictive. It creates a small virtual pouch uh, by partitioning the upper portion of the stomach and creating a narrow tunnel through which the, the food passes um, under resistance. And that resistance can be adjusted. The adjustment is uh, performed by accessing this port right here, which is placed underneath the skin. You can inflate a bladder inside this band uh, if you increase, put more fluid in, increase the, the bladder volume, it decreases the aperture which, which, with which the food goes through. That increases the resistance and makes it easier to get full quicker. And it's uh, considered probably the, the least risky procedure, uh, operative procedure, because there is no um, cutting or rearrangement of intestines or the stomach. Uh, the bands are adjustable, as I mentioned, and uh, this, this process uh, begins four to six weeks after surgery. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's, it's a very um, empirical process. It's based on uh, um, your personal band, how it was put in, how things healed. There are a lot of factors that go into uh, this. It's a very personalized process, but basically what you're getting, uh, getting to is a point where you get appropriate restriction that allows a certain one to two pounds of weight loss per week. So the uh, gastric band has some advantages. It's got the lowest mortality and complication rate. Um, it's minimally invasive. Uh, all these procedures are relatively minimally invasive, requiring, you know, uh, about five incisions, small incisions each. Um, there's, the big plus here is there's no stapling cutting or intestinal rerouting. Uh, it's adjustable and reversible, as is the weight loss. Um, and there's a, a minimal malnutrition risk because you're not you don't have that malabsorption, okay? The disadvantages are it's a uh, slower uh, rate of weight loss and probably the least uh, absolute weight loss um, 
overall. Um, it does require regular follow-up for adjustments, but uh, the important thing with any of these procedures is that you're followed closely in the first year, and we, we, we do that for all the procedures. And it requires an implantable medical device. What we like to do is work with y'all. Y'all have, y'all come to this having done a lot of personal research, a lot of soul searching, and, and that's important because to um, uh, go against that, th those personal uh, inclinations is to compromise the potential compliance factor. So we leave much of this up to you. What we're here to do is help you um, confirm that, that uh, decision and point out any potential problems uh, that may uh, compromise the success. There are situations where we have a patient come to us who maybe requests a, a band and uh, because of a number of different reasons it's decided that a bypass might be better and vice versa. Um, but in general, we're, we're here to um, accommodate you. We think that you all have a, a very good idea of what might work for you and uh, that's important for the compliance issue. As far as the gastric bypass goes, um, the weight loss is, is optimal, the, the mortality rate is acceptable, 30-day um, national is 0.14%. Um, it's advertised as a permanent procedure. Technically it can be reversed, but it's not a procedure that we do with that even remote expectation that it would be reversed. It does not require an implanted medical device, which is a, a plus, and the hospital stays two, two and a half days post-op. The track record of its success is, is quite long and uh, undisputed. Um, the standard follow-up is required. Uh, on the band side, uh, again, it's a small gastric pouch with an implantable uh, medical device. The 30-day mortality is 0.03%. Weight loss is a bit less, 50 to 55% long-term. Um, it's adjustable, which is uh, um, an advantage. It's reversible, um, and hospital stays are shorter, one day-ish. Uh, it's newer, but the track record is clearly out there. Um, and standard follow-up is necessary, uh, it, perhaps maybe a little more frequent with the initial adjustments. Uh, and the sleeve gastrectomy is, uh, um, shows an average weight loss of 60%. Um, it, uh, it's a permanent procedure, obviously we can't put that portion of the stomach back in. Hospital stays about two days and the mor mortality rate's low, intermediate between the band and the bypass. So when we talk about risk um, of surgery, we talk about short and long-term risk. And there are risks that are generic to any operation, to all operations, and there, there are risks that are specific to uh, specific procedures. Type of uh, uh, risks that we're talking about here uh, with bypass um, are pulmonary, um, that is pneumonia, breathing difficulties, bleeding, um, infection, which is rare with the laparoscopic procedure, nausea and vomiting. Um, the two big complications that we, we um, are ever vigilant for are blood clots, uh, which can go to the lungs in the form of a pulmonary embolism, um, and anastomotic leaks, where we connect the intestine to the pouch. Uh, Long-term risk, uh, there are a number of them. Uh, weight regain obviously is a, a, a disappointing complication. Um, anemia, uh, malnutrition, vitamin and mineral deficiencies, kidney stones, gallstones. There are others including ulcers. I spoke about smoking 
And what I found in my experience is that smokers have a, a high risk for forming ulcers and um, uh, even to the point of perforation, which is an emergency. So I'm, I'm very um, dogmatic about the smoking thing. Um, band surgery, again, you have the generic risk, bleeding in, in pulmonary, port side infection, nausea, vomiting. But specific uh, long-term issues with the band include band erosion, band slippage, Port displacement and tubing occlusions are the most frequent issues with that port under, underneath the skin. And uh, weight regain, again, is a disappointing complication. With the sleeve, you have the generic complications. Leakage is the main concern with sleeve. You have that long staple line. Um, and uh, that's, that's a concern early on. And then long term, you can get uh, uh, reflux, weight regain again, and some uh, other problems like narrowing of the pouch or the uh, sleeve. As a comprehensive bariatric program, we, we, we like to uh, mitigate these risks and uh, we're very thorough in our perioperative efforts to do that. It starts with pre-op clearances, you know, anyone with sleep apnea, anyone with coronary artery disease are evaluated by pulmonologists and cardiologists respectively. And the purpose is to mitigate or, or to reduce or optimize the risk uh, once we take a patient to surgery. Uh, we spoke about pulmonary complications um, uh, such as pneumonia and atelectasis. Atelectasis is a condition where after general anesthesia, your little lung sacs collapse, and that reduces your, the efficiency of your lungs, and it can lead to pneumonia. So it's important to exercise the lungs after your operation, and we do that with early ambulation, turn, cough, and deep breathe, and the incentive spirometry. You all may have seen those little machines that you suck on. I see some heads nodding. Don't breathe out, breathe in, right? Doesn't work if you blow on it. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> okay, the blood clot thing, big problem. And it, while it's rare, um, it's rare because we're diligent about preventing them. Um, the consequences can be quite severe. Um, Compression boots, um, y'all may be familiar with, squeeze your legs to keep the blood moving out of the lower extremities. Early ambulation, again, is important to keep the blood moving out of the legs. And anticoagulants that keep the blood from being clotty. We don't like it to clot. And finally, uh, the, uh, well, the antibiotics and wound care instructions are, are directed towards infection. But again, wound infections in laparoscopic or minim minimally invasive surgery are rare. Uh, a big plus with that kind of operation. But finally, I want to say something about the leak test. The two most common causes of death in the early post-op period with bypass is a leak or a pulmonary embolism. That's why we're all about getting you up the night of surgery, keeping you on the blood thinners, getting the compression boots on. But as for the leak, we have to be um, um, very diligent. We do a leak test in the operating room while you're asleep to make sure there's no leakage. Um, and if one's identified, it's fixed right then and there. Um, and our practice is to repeat a leak test in the morning after surgery before we allow you to drink anything. And that, for that test, you go to x-ray, swallow some dye, and then we get a picture. Okay, I don't take a picture in the operating room, but I do do a leak test. The leak test on, on the morning following surgery uh, affords us a picture. Okay. And Certainly, if there was a problem there, it would be addressed immediately. Uh, but after that leak test, the morning after surgery, if that looks okay, then we start showing the liquids. And home soon thereafter. <laughs> <laughs>